and especially for the judiciary. The courts have in the past faced criticism even from President Uhuru Kenyatta and Rail Odinga. But Chief Justice David Maraga has defended decisions reached by judges, arguing that they are based on evidences presented before courts. But even with the challenges, the team, which comprises the AG, the Directorate of Criminal Investigations, the Ethic and Anti-Corruption Commission, and the Director of Public Prosecution, remains confident that the war can still be won. We need to own this country. This is our own country. Nobody, not the development partners or any other partners will help us. We have to help ourselves. We must be honest. We must be people of integrity. When you see from us the hospital money, loans money, development fund for all this country, what do you think you are? You are not better than that terrorist you are battling there in the Ducit and other areas. Kihara also blamed what he says is a lacuna in the law, which in some instances has made it impossible to punish orders of public office implicated in graft. Other speakers at the event held at the Bahamas of Kenya said corruption will only end through a combined effort by both the public and private sector. We have to form a national movement against corruption. Women coming together, these sectors, to come together under one umbrella. Kenya is blessed with a lot of veteran journalists and editors who have worked and left the newsrooms. We want to find a way of engaging them to come back and mentor the, the existing journalists to know how to work through the challenges that exist. With pressure mounting on the government to fight the war on corruption and an increasing expectation from members of the public, the multi-agency team says that it will stop at nothing until the war on corruption is won. Silas Apollo, NTV. Now that report by Silas Apollo forms our opinion count question tonight and we ask, do you think the judiciary is an impediment in the war against Corruption. Well, we also have a poll on the same on Twitter, so head there and hit yes or no, and we'll read the poll results later in this bulletin. You can also send your feedback via text message on 20686 or tweet us at NTV Kenya at Mark Masai at Smithy Vidyathi, and we'll read some of your comments during this broadcast. Now, both the prosecution and the defense in the Deputy Chief Justice Philomena Mwilu abuse of office case scored a goal each this morning. The High Court has allowed Queen's Counsel Kawa Kureshi, a British national, to prosecute the case, while Senior Counsels Okongo Mogeni and James Orengo also got the green light to continue representing the Deputy Chief Justice. Well, the DCJ's second petition, seeking to have the case heard as a civil matter, will be heard on February the 18th, 2019. These were key rulings for the Deputy Chief Justice and Director of Public Prosecutions, and the stage is now set for a titanic legal battle in a case that is the first of its kind to be handled by the judiciary. In addition, in as far as Mr. Kureshi paid the Kenya shillings 400 on 5th of December 2018, his admission fee, he met and, uh, the further condition imposed by Section 11, Subsection 2 of the Advocates Act. While it is accepted that he does not have a Kenyan practicing certificate, we have already taken the view that it is not required by statute. In her argument, DCJ Philomena Mwilu has stated that Kureishi, being a foreigner, had not satisfied the legal requirements to practice in a Kenyan court. The ODPP had submitted that the Queen's Council had been issued with a pass by the Kenyan authorities and had paid all fees and received the needed certificate to practice law in Kenya. The petitioner has not told us how the issuance of this special pass violates the Act and the regulations and we are not persuaded, therefore, that by their submission that there is any basis to fault the issuance of that pass. The facts placed before us do not in any way satisfy us that the conduct of the two senior counsel would amount to a conflict of interest insofar as this petition all matters related are concerned. DPP Haji had in his petition presented by Prosecutor Dorcas Oduor stated that the two senior counsels, by virtue of being senators, had participated in a meeting in which the Senate's Justice and Legal Affairs Committee discussed the appointment of Hawar Quraysh. Record of proceedings before the committee, the information that was given to the committee by the first respondent related to the appointment of Mr. Quraysh 
it did not touch on or have any bearings on the merits of this petition or any other matter involving the petitioner. But even as the court clears the way for both sets of lawyers to continue to prosecute this case, the media has now come under sharp focus by the court itself over its reportage of when exactly the judiciary gave a go-ahead to the Queen's Council to continue to prosecute this case. It should never really uh, be discussed or debated in the manner that would now bring perceptions uh, that probably the ruling today uh, is just a matter of course uh, that the judiciary had already, already cleared Mr. Qureshi. Uh, that is the only point that we wanted to bring out of the media. Senator James Sorengo had highlighted an article carried in one of the dailies that quoted a letter from Chief Registrar Anne Amadi to the DPP stating that Qureshi did not need any more certification to practice in the country. Leila Mohamed, NTV. Let's get into politics now. Deputy President William Ruto has expressed support for President Uhuru Kenyatta's executive order, which handed Interior Cabinet Secretary Fred Matiangi additional responsibilities, which appear to be the same ones the DP himself should be in charge of. Oruto said that all government officers should immediately align their operations to the order so as to ensure effective communication and the implementation of projects. Here's Vincent Odor with the details. About 24 hours after Deputy President William Ruto had a meeting and lunch with President Kenyatta under clouds of curiosity among many, the DP has openly endorsed the head of state's executive order number no. one of 2019, which made the Cabinet Secretary for Interior and Coordination of National Government be in charge of all national development implementation programs and communication. Through his Twitter account, DP Ruto has asked all government officers at all levels to align their operations to the president's order, which set up committees at county, regional, and national levels. He says the purpose of the order is to ensure effectiveness in implementation of projects and efficient communication. The elevation of C.S. Matiangi has been seen as a move that has taken up what the deputy president had been doing as he traversed the country launching projects, adding that he is ensuring that the state's plans are being implemented. I've never seen anywhere in the world where the deputy president dishes projects. <laughs> it can't happen. And the sword was left in the hand of one person. Health Cabinet Secretary Cecily Karioki has made her stand known, a stand which could be an indictment on the work the DP has been doing, as he was the one who had, in his own words, been in charge of development project implementation. It should be supported, not over-politicized. It is being over-politicized, it is because of the disorder which we have witnessed. President Kenyatta's move is seen as a strong sign of the president using his constitutional powers to firmly assert his role in steering his administration. And Ruto is not listening. At one point he said that President Alisema to Turkey Siasa this time round and I'm going to tone down. The next time he goes to Western or he goes to coast, then agenda changes. So President maybe would say that uh, this is not this is now too much. So what, what do I do? <laughs> Let me set you free so that you implement your idea. President Uhura, I think, is now rising up for the occasion. He is supposed to protect us. If he is weak and he leaves that role to his deputy, we will take our loyalty to his deputy. The implications of the order on the operations of his deputy are yet to be seen, as Focus is trained on whether DP Ruto will stop his frequent countrywide development tours, which have been termed as campaign tours for 2022 presidential bid. Vincent Odur. NTV. All right, elsewhere now, and the Supreme Court has overturned a ruling by the Court of Appeal that allowed Muslim students at St. Paul's Kiwanjani Secondary School in Isiolo to wear hijabs, that's the head cover worn by Muslim women. In the ruling, the judges stated that every school has a right to determine its own rules. In 2014, the school had suspended three of its students for wearing hijabs, arguing it was against the school uniform policy.
The case on wearing of hijabs by Muslim students in St. Paul's Kiwanjani Secondary School in Isiolo has been in the corridors of justice for more than three years. But now the matter has been put to rest. The Supreme Court has pronounced itself and the verdict is in favor of the institution. The judges concluded that the school did not discriminate the students by declining to allow the wearing of hijabs, holding that every school has the right to set its own rules. The ruling effectively overturns an earlier decision by the appellate court rendered in September of 2016, allowing Muslim students to wear hijabs as part of their school uniform. This ruling followed a high court verdict in May of 2015 that held wearing of hijabs in school was discriminatory. That decision was then given as a directive to the Teachers Service Commission and the Isiolo County Education Office, which at the time had allowed female students of St. Paul's Kiwanjani Day Mixed Secondary School to wear hijabs in class. The school in question is sponsored by the Methodist Church, which had moved to the Supreme Court, saying that religion could not be used as a way of escaping adherence to authority. Mel Miendo, NTV. I have a feeling this is not the last we'll be hearing about this, quite a sensitive one and a topic of discussion still as this latest development has come out. To something else quite disturbing. Two foreigners have been charged with stripping a Kenyan woman naked and taking videos of her while naked against her will. Now, in a video that NTV has accessed, the men are seen mocking the lady as they film her, even as she decries their behavior. NTV's Kevin Mutai brings us the details of the ordeal, accompanied by footage of the episode that saw the German and his Ukrainian friend arrested and arraigned in Shanzu. An apartment in Kilifi played host to an episode of drama that would end up in court. A Kenyan woman who alleges she was stripped naked and filmed against her will by the two Caucasian men she was with. This video clip acquired by NTV, according to the police, was recorded by one of the suspects identified as Wetabe Shestovetsky, shows the woman in a confrontation with a white man identified as Zabin Sasha, who is also taking his own video of the drama. She is hard speaking in disapproval of the video taking, but the men did not seem to care but instead appeared to be deriving some pleasure out of the incident. The physical confrontation ensued shortly after she threatened to call the police. The two, according to police records, stripped the woman naked and took the video without her consent in an incident that occurred a week ago. The suspects were arrested on the following day and arraigned before Principal Magistrate David Odiambo on Monday, January. They claim the woman misreported the incident that took place in Tuapa, Kilifi County at the Kenya Medical Association Apartments. In her court documents, the woman claimed she met one of the suspects on an online dating site by the name Tinder early this month where they chatted and planned to meet. On the material day, the complainant said she traced her new friend and they met in Tuapa town where they proceeded to the apartment where the man was living. And we agreed. Uh, she said, okay, we are already settled and uh, that she will send a statement in writing with her ID on it that she will withdraw the charges. And uh, she sent it last night from Kisumu by bus to you and I pick it up this morning. The court declined to allow the case to be withdrawn in the absence of the complainant. According to the apartment block managers, the two suspects are not registered tenants and had only leased the house from a different lady who the management says has been unable to pay her rent and was yet to be served with a notice to vacate the property. Each of the suspects was released on a 100,000 shillings cash bail. They are expected to appear in court on Friday to take plea. Kevin Mutai, NTV, Mombasa. Well, what a nasty experience and certainly hope that the relevant investigations are carried out and also that justice is served. Elsewhere, a suspect who issued motor vehicle insurance for one of the cars used by the 14 Riverside Complex attackers, Ali Gishunge, is the latest person to be arrested and arraigned in court over last week's terrorist attack. 
Detectives are also following the money trail of a key suspect who withdrew 400,000 shillings 13 times within a day at Diamond Trust Bank in Isli. And to be Seth Olale with an update on the nature and progress of the Riverside attack investigations. Zipola Wamboi Karanja, an insurance agent for Direct Line Insurance Company Limited, admitted to having facilitated the procuring of a third party cover for the motor vehicle registration number KCN340E, which was used by attackers during the 14 Riverside terrorist attack. Zipola further told the court that she also facilitated the procurement of a third party cover for a Toyota Fielder registration number KCF-872R, which was discovered in the compound of the main attacker, Ali Salim Gishunge, in Gwango Estate in Mushata, Kiambu County. The suspect told senior principal magistrate Martha Mutuku that the insurance for both motor vehicles was not obtained by Ali Gishunge, but two other suspects, namely Stephen Mwangi Wambugu and Benson Mwangi Maina, who are yet to be arrested. We can say how they are connected to Ali Salim Gichunge, since they are the ones who ordered for the covers, and, uh, I, and they, give, they, give, they give their details. So me, I don't have any direct connection with Ali Salim Gichunge. The court allowed the prosecution to detain the insurance agent for 15 more days to allow completion of investigations and apprehend the other two persons involved in the procurement of the motor vehicle covers. I appreciate the seriousness of the investigations into the attack and the complexity of the same. I also consider the submissions of the respondent and check not of the personal um, circumstances that she has outlined. The court has to balance both private and public interest. Meanwhile, six other persons, including a bank manager and a multiple M-Pesa outlet owner, are spending another night in police cells and the court will determine the application opposing their 30 days detention on Friday. Police are investigating how Hassan Abdinur registered a total of 52 M-Pesa outlets, 47 of which were registered during the months of October, November and December 2018. Detectives have also established that Noor registered 47 SIM cards using different identity cards and names and were only using two handsets which were all within Eastleigh area, Nairobi County. In addition, detectives found that Noor received 9 million shillings from South Africa and withdrew the same through an m till number and later through Diamond Trust Bank, Isli Branch, where 5.2 million shillings was withdrawn within a day. Seth Olale, NTV. As the investigations into this particular issue continues, on the other side of this, there's a side to this story, and it is that families of those who died in the January 15th terror attack at 14 Riverside Drive continue to come to terms with their loss. Cellulant employees Ashford Kuria and John Ndiritu were laid to rest today as their families demand for justice. A somber mood hangs over the village of Kehoya in Kangema constituency, Muranga County. Friend. Tears flowed freely as the family remembered Ashford Kuria as a man who lived his life with honor and died in just the same way. I find strength in knowing that you are selfless, even at the point of such a risky attack. You try to help others, ensuring their safety for your own. The 36-year-old head of product development died two days shy of his birthday. To my son's killers, I will not hate you. The other mourners blamed authorities for the way such attacks are handled. They specifically faulted the judiciary. This terrorist must not be released or given cash bail. Elsewhere in Moya, Kirinyaga County, John Derito's family gave the deceased a hero's send-off. The family eulogized Derito as a hard-working man whose demise has left a huge void in their lives. I just feel empty, broken and shattered. I know you're in a better place and you'll always watch over us. I never thought there would come a day 
when you would leave for work only to never return. <laughs> this was a very dark time for me because you were my everything. Yesterday, 23rd would have been our third year anniversary. Derito leaves behind a widow and a five-month-old daughter, Charity Mwangi and TV. Oh, May the souls of the departed rest in peace and strength and comfort to the families. Elsewhere, a 65-year-old man has been arrested by police about the matter. Now, the family only found out about the incident after they discovered the girl regularly came home with money and sweets. Here's NTV's Melita Oletenges with the details. It is a story of a girl who innocently fell Perry's uncle, Timothy, also not his real name. He suspected something strange. He says complaints had been made about the suspect in the past by villagers, but they say no one believed that the neighbor would take advantage of Mary's innocence. So, but eventually, the investigations were carried out and police took action. After we were through with the examination by the doctors and they confirmed that the girl had been interfered with, the man here has been arrested. Actually, he's in custody as we talk and he'll be appearing in court tomorrow. He is expected to be presented in court on Friday. Milita, Oletenges, NTV, Nyeri. May justice be served and may help go to that 13-year-old girl. Thank you to Melita Oletengis for bringing this to the fore. Now, just before we take a break and give you a recap of our opinion counts question, actually, we gave you some uh, uh, um, a request here to get, give a yes or no answer. And we have 467 votes in so far and about 20 minutes to go for the vote to close. And uh, just before we go to that, let's draw your attention to a little jig earlier today. And it doesn't have audio, but uh, as you can see, that is a man himself, Atwoli. <laughs> Francis Atwoli, and behind him we can see Wilson Socion. This was earlier when Nat joined <laughs> Kotu. So what do we want to ask? We want to ask, what music do you think Francis Atwoli and his <laughs> buddies are jiving <sighs> to give us your thoughts it, it just looks so amusing without audio doesn't yeah, we it? haven't <laughs> played we haven't played with this footage it is what it was and they're trying out something i think it looks like they're different songs playing but it's one song they're, they're dancing to the same song you tell us what you think they were dancing to and what we will do is we will <laughs> later in this broadcast reveal which song it was by playing back that footage with the audio and uh, we will also sample your views on what kind of music you think. Any guesses? Ballet, ballet. <laughs> really? Ballet, ballet? <laughs> Possibly, but I kind of highly doubt it. Okay. All right, uh, so from that, let's now remind you of our opinion count question and it relates to our top story on the broadcast tonight. We are asking, do you think that the judiciary is an impediment in the war against corruption? 467 votes in, 21 minutes to go for this poll to close. Robert Josochi, you say yes, the judiciary has been an impediment, but not wholesomely. Judges are bound by the law to free suspects on bond. However, they have been using this carelessly. The solution is thus a review of bail terms and specifically bail terms for corruption cases and terrorism. All right, Charles Mutai, you say yes, the judiciary should consider wider public good in corruption cases. They need to be conscious that rogue investigators and prosecutors exist in such cases. The public is grossly shortchanged. Keep them coming in. We have 20 minutes to go for this poll to close. Tell us yes or no what you think on whether the judiciary is an impediment in the war against corruption. And that poll is on Twitter. And you can also tweet us at Smriti Vidyarthi, at NTV Kenya, at Mark Masai. You are indeed watching NTV tonight. Time for a breather. More when we return.
thanks very much for staying with us. The Kenya Private Security Workers Union has welcomed the move to arm private guards. At the same time, the Private Security Authority has assured that comprehensive training will be conducted before private security guards are handed weapons. Now, Interior Cabinet Secretary Fred Matiangi has already given a nod to the same, but guards will only be armed after receiving special training. And NTV's uh, Zainab Isma with more. The on and off debate on arming private security guards manning key installations has been reignited and this time it appears a conclusion is in the horizon. If you cannot protect yourself, then you, are no, you have no business of protecting you, a land or a property. The guards are unhappy with some of the recent comments on the matter. Now in the set of leaders, Contributing, supporting Dr. Matiang in his efforts and the CEO, they are talking negatively about arming of the guards. And they, are, they think the private security officer diluted in terms of their professional. Meanwhile, the process of training and equipping private security guards has already begun. According to the Private Security Authority leadership, the move to arm guards is in line with the state's directive on integrating it to the national security. As government, we have seen. The weak point that we have uh, in the counter-terrorism strategy is basically the private security industry. He acknowledges that there might be some elements in the private security sector who may want to take advantage of the changes to engage in criminal activities. To cap this, the authority will put in place regulations that require security firms to have armories for safekeeping of the firearms, which must only be used by officers on duty. Mandatory vetting will be undertaken in the next six months for security firms and their employees before the guards are given firearms. We are not going to arm a guard who is guarding a residential home. We are going to do security assessment on areas that are high risk targets. Security firms will also be vetted afresh to weed out criminals in the industry. Currently, there are about 500,000 guards hired by an estimated 1,000 private security firms. Zainab Ismail, NTV. Don't know whether to call this next story Siasa Chaffo or just Siasa because it's unprecedented. Msambweni Member of Parliament, Suleiman Dori and Malindi Member of Parliament, Aisha Jumwa, have been expelled from the Orange Democratic Movement Party, ODM. And the two have been found guilty of contravening the party's constitution by supporting another political party. But the duo have rejected the verdict and in their defence cite the handshake which allows engagement with other parties. Ken Mijung reports that the two may be forced to seek a fresh mandate through other political parties. Mwatuona sisi tushapanda na tuaito hatushuki part of the comments that put Suleiman Dori and Aisha Jumwa in trouble. Sisi hatutochoka tutazidi kufuatana na serikali tutazidi kufuatana na naibu wa rais ali muhimu anatusikiza na anawafanyia watu wapwani. They have been defiant, occasionally overbearing to their party leadership, but it caught up with them, and after lengthy deliberations, the verdict was in. The two members of parliament be de-whipped immediately from all parliamentary committees that they serve in the National Assembly with immediate effect, and that the minority whip of the party, Honorable Junet Mohammed, should move with speed to make the communication to the leadership of the House. Accused of party disloyalty after they declared their support for Deputy President William Ruto's 2022 presidential bid, the two say they were not afforded sufficient opportunity to defend themselves. They also say the decision is unfair and cannot stand. Kitu gani ambacho hivi sasa kitakuwa kina ugumu wa kusamehewa kama mengi yalisameheka kuna wale watu waliumia, kuna wale watu waliuawa, kuna wale watu waliapisha watu, mweshimiwa mm. uh, Raila Odinga. Kila kitu kikasemekana kimesamehewa. A reason that the party secretary general says does not add up. If indeed the handshake was about endorsing anyone for 2022, the first person to be endorsed on the steps of Harambe House would have been Raila Odinga by Uhuru Kenyatta. But because it did not happen, you cannot therefore uh, ascribe things that were outside of that handshake into the handshake. ODM party 
will now write to the registrar of political parties asking for the removal of their names from the list of party members. Once their names are removed, the registrar will then notify the Speaker of the National Assembly, who will in turn declare their seats vacant, paving way for by elections. Aisha and Dori are not the first to face the wrath of ODM party. In 2016, then Budalangi Member of Parliament and ODM Secretary General Ababu Namwamba lost the position after facing allegations of disloyalty. He lost his seat in the following election after he ran on the Labour Party ticket. Kwale Governor Salim Vuria also rebelled against the party, but he jumped ship joining Jubilee Party before any action was taken against him. Ken Mijungu, NTV. All right, from politics to a different kind of a story, a 36-year-old man from Kakoi village, Malava constituency in Kakamega County, is nursing serious injuries after he was attacked by villagers who accused him of sorcery. The villagers claim that the suspect has caused numerous road accidents in the area after they found, or they found a list of accident victims in his possessions. Akias Mwasame reports from Kakamega. Angry Kakoi village residents exhibiting their wrath on 36-year-old Makoli Lumula. The residents accused Lumula for allegedly engaging in witchcraft. The armed residents destroyed his paraphernalia before setting his house ablaze. Residents claim that a list of people who have died through road accidents was found in his possession, leading to the attack. They blamed Lumula of the misfortunes in the village. <laughs> Wewe si mtu wa hapa na picha zako ziko hapa. Zinapatikana hapa. So swali ni kwamba anazipata namna gani? Police rescued Lumla before taking him to Kabras police station. The police cautioned the residents against taking the law into their own hands. Kuna suspicion kwamba hawa watu wanakuja wananunua hizo picha kutoka kwa hizo au my agents na hizo pengine wanafanyia ushirikina hapa. Kwa hivyo ningependa tu kuonya watu wawe waangalifu. Usikubali mtu yoyote anakupiga picha bila ruhusa ama ovyo ovyo. The suspect is currently receiving medication at the Kakamega Refer Hostel. Zakius Masame NTV Kakamega. Zakius Masame's uh, report now brings us to our next break here on NTV tonight. That's right. Next up it's the business news with NTV's Julian Amboko. Stand by.
Glad you could join us for the only name in business. Welcome to the program. I am Julian Amboko. A lobby group for sugarcane farmers has intensified the quest to reform the sugar sector in the country by forming a parallel task force that is set to traverse the country in the next two weeks and to table a, a report before the president by the end of February. The group Sugar Campaign for Change, or SUCAM, has also opposed the government proposal seeking to introduce sugarcane zoning in the country, terming it illegal and detrimental to farmers. Here's Lillian Carrier with finer details on the sugar sector. Barely two weeks after the government's sugar task force was forced to stop its public engagements due to hostility from farmers over pending arrears, a lobby group, the Sugar Campaign for Change, has thrown a spanner in the works. On account of being our own experts in sugarcane farming, have formed our own task force. That task force of farmers arises from an alliance of sugarcane farmers organization that we call NAF, NASFO, Kenya National Alliance of Sugarcane Farmers Organization. It's in place, being coordinated by SUCAM. The group has released a public engagement schedule and will begin by holding sessions with farmers in Zoya next week on Monday and make stops in 15 other towns in the next two weeks. SUCAM has also opposed zoning as one of the proposals in the new sugar regulation, terming it as a breach of the constitution. The proposal that zoning be introduced represents a direct contravention of the competitive law, which rules our anti-competitive practices. And, and anything that might distort prices in any market uh, or restrict trade. Zoning forces, fa forces farmers to be tied to a single buyer for their crops. And that just, and, and, and that just quite simply removes all opportunity to get any price but one, as set by the miller they are allocated to. Sukam wants farmers to be given autonomy to sell their cane where they deem best. I have not been paid since March, and somebody wants to zone me to Zoya Sugar Me so that I do not sell my cane to the factories that perform. Because within Zoya, there are factories that perform. Why don't we give scope to factories that perform? The ones that do not perform, you know, the economic law is clear, you know. The law of uh, competition is very clear. In business, you perform. Or you die. The challenges facing the sugar sector continue to persist, with farmers still decrying lack of payment of their arrears by the government. Lillian Kiarie and TV Business. Let's move on to the capital markets. Now, paints manufacturer Crown Paints has issued a profit warning for the full year of 2018, expecting earnings for the period to be at least 25% lower than they were in the period to December 2017. The company's board has attributed this advance to, to adverse market conditions in Tanzania, Uganda and Rwanda, which it says have affected the subsidiary's performance. This profit warning implies that the company's net profit for the period ended December 2018 will, will not exceed a 167.5 million shillings. The company's share closed Thursday's trading at 80 shillings, posting no change since the start of 2019. Crown Paints now joins the list of companies that have issued profit warnings for the period under review, including Britam, UAP Holdings and Bamburi Cement. The National Treasury has raised 38.5 billion shillings through the two-year and 15-year bonds floated earlier this month, mobilizing 96% of the target 40 billion shillings. Unlike the trend witnessed for the better part of 2018, the two bonds on the whole attracted a high appetite from investors, with bids received exceeding the amount on offer by 155%. Important to note, however, is that whereas the two-year bond posted oversubscription, the 15-year bond reported low appetite, attracting bids worth 63% of its target amount for the period under review. The period of sale for the two bonds opened on the 2nd of January 2019 and closed on the 22nd.
On to matters labor. The Central Organization of Trade Unions of Kenya has hinted at a plan to withdraw a case it had filed in court challenging the government's 1.5% levy that was meant to go into the National Housing Development Fund. Withdrawing the case will pave the way for the implementation of the government's ambitious housing project in which it aims to build half a million housing units by 2022. Victor Kiprop with that story. The government's plan to build 500,000 affordable houses by 2022 hit a snag late last year after the Employment and Labor Relations Court granted the Central Organization of Trade Unions application to have it suspended. The cessation of hostilities between the government and KOTU follows the government's decision to raise the minimum wage for workers by 5%. I and Wilson Sosion, we joined hands to make sure that uh, we negotiate with the government to gazette the minimum wage of 5% before we talk of the, the, the president's, uh, 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 one of the items on his agenda, for agenda, housing. And indeed, the government gazetted the minimum wage on Monday this week. The Koto leadership also announced that its members would no longer be urged to leave the National Social Security Fund, NSSF, as it had earlier warned, where its contributions are valued at about 269 billion shillings. That comes after the government yielded to pressure and allowed representatives of Koto and the Federation of Kenya Employers to remain in the board of the fund. These developments highlight the growing influence of the labor union, which added yet another feather to its heart with the admission of Kenya's most powerful teachers union, the Kenya National Union of Teachers, as its 45th affiliate workers union. We have decided freely and willfully as an organization that now is the time to team up with all the workers of this country. When we point out something, be it an employer or a political leader for that matter, or a president of our republic and his deputy and his entire cabinet, they will be circumstantially compelled to listen to Kenya's working men and women. The return of the Kenyan National Union of Teachers to the Central Organization of Trade Unions Court after 53 years means that the umbrella body's oh, membership okay. has crossed the 3 million mark, making it one of Africa's largest labor unions and an even more powerful organization locally. Victor Kiprop, NTV Business, Nairobi. Let's talk about monetary policy. The prevailing macroeconomic conditions of the prevailing macroeconomic conditions are creating a favorable environment for a slash of the central bank's benchmark rate in the near term. With the first monetary policy committee meeting for 2019 set for Monday next week, a section of analysts see room for a slash in the benchmark rate, which is presently set at 9%. Inflation and the exchange rate are anticipated to be at the top of the agenda during the Monday meeting, both of which have shown favorable trends in the recent past. Despite the rate cap still viewed as a key challenge the central bank will confront in arriving at its decision, with the question of constrained lending to the private sector being one of the key sticking points. We still see inflation uh, continuing to be within the CBK's range because with the reduced oil prices especially and the good ongoing agricultural harvests. So that will tend to increase the likelihood of the CBK cutting the monetary policy rate. CBK, the second factor is private sector credit. The central bank uh, is, is keen to expand private sector credit this year. So I think those two factors will increase the inclination of monetary policy to be accommodative this year. However, the rate cap remains a constraint. One of the world's largest aircraft manufacturers, Airbus, which is based in Europe, has termed the uncertainty of a Brexit a disgrace. Britain is getting closer. <laughs>
later, finally, uh, a new leader and also a peaceful transition. That's right. I mean, but some people would have their interpretation of what is being called as peaceful transition. A lot of uh, doubts there. But quick recovery to him, nonetheless, uh, he needs his good health for his new responsibilities. Now, earlier, we had a video that we showed without audio of uh, Francis Atoli of Kotu and uh, Wilson Socion of Nut. Actually, Nut was joining Kotu mm -hmm. earlier today. And we wanted you to figure out what they were dancing to, which tune they were dancing to, and have some, I think we can, if we can play it first, before we play it, let me see what people are saying. Uh, Mike Adaka Mbarikiwa, you say, I guess Atoli and his colleagues were dancing to a rumba tune by Franco, and this actually goes, this rhymes with uh, what, rhymes, this rhymes with what uh, Catherine Wangeshi is saying. She figures it's Mamu by Franco, and uh, this is G Mgenge. <laughs> you say, I think those were Heshwa Dundai. You know that song? <laughs> no. Okay, okay, okay. I'll play it for you. <laughs> I'll, I'll play it for you uh, a bit later on. Let me see if I have any other. Um, I think those, yeah. Oh, so this is someone who said, send that video that was reported in the news, please. So let's, I think, what do you think? I have no idea. But okay. to be honest, watching him without music, at some point, it looked like he was almost tripping over, like not even really dancing. But I have a feeling that all those responses are closer to what you thought, because you thought it was Bangra. Uh, ba balle, balle. Mm -hmm. But also, Socion looked like he was doing Audi at the back. If you just Possibly. just watch it, let's have a look. <laughs> genre of rumba. Right, correct. Although we need to pinpoint exactly what song that was. Missing you. Yeah, neither me. All right, um, so that was our lighter moment. And from that, we shift focus to the sports news. That's coming up in just a moment with Sean Cardavis. You might be dancing. Stand <laughs>
A very good evening to you. I'm Sean Carter Villas with the latest sports news. Now, the iconic KICC will be absent from the 2019 Safari Rally, which will begin at the Kasarani Sports Complex and feature a super special stage at the same venue. This year's competition will be a candidate event for the 2020 World Rally Championship circuit and as such is bound to attract a lot of interest from international teams. Meanwhile, after a two-year break, KCB has made a return to sponsoring motorsports in the country. The 2019 Safari Rally will start off at the Kasarani Sports Complex rather than the traditional KICC as changes are ringed around Kenya's premier motorsports event that is seeking a return to the World Rally Championship. We have to look at the security aspect uh, of uh, the event. I'm not saying that KICC is not secure enough, uh, but we want to bring in as many people as possible. The Safari Rally, which will be a candidate event for the World Rally Championship, will be held in July away from the traditional Easter dates. In keeping with international standards, the Safari will be run on closed roads largely around Naivasha and Elementaita, and there is interest from international teams. I have met uh, virtually all the teams, um, right from uh, Tommy McLean, who is the team principal for Toyota, and he's expressed interest to uh, come down and see what we are doing. Uh, maybe send a car. The rally was first held as the East Africa Coronation Safari in Kenya, Uganda and Tanganyika as a celebration of the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II in 1953 before being named as a safari rally in 1974. It last featured in the WRC in 2002 with Colin McRae navigated by Nikki Grister winning in a Ford Focus. Meanwhile, the Kenya National Rally Championship and the National Autocross Championship have both received a 75 million shilling sponsorship injection from KCB Bank, who have committed to the disciplines for three years. 20 million shillings will be spent on the staging of KNRC events and 5 million shillings for autocross. We are giving 20 million specifically for all the KNRC events, not the safari. The 45 included the rally. There will be a total of seven national rally events beginning with the KCB Nakuru Rally on the 2nd of February, while Autocross will have 10 events uh, starting with the first competition in Mai Mahiu on Sunday. Kenya Defence Forces cross-country defending champions Helen Nobiri and Hilary Kering will be seeking to extend their reign at the 38th edition of the KDF Cross-Country Championships that will take place early tomorrow morning at the Kahawa Garrison Barracks. The championships will bring together the Kenya Army, Kenya Navy and Kenya Air Force as the Defence Forces seek to select a team that will represent the KDF at the National Cross-Country Trials in February. While 5,000 meters champion Helen Obiri is optimistic that she will pick up from where she left off last year when she takes on to the field at the 38th edition of the KDF Cross Country Championships at the Kahawa Barracks. Obiri, the Commonwealth and African champion who had a brilliant season in 2018, climaxing in her winning the IAAF Diamond League title, has enjoyed a good start in cross country this season, winning the second Athletics Kenya Cross Country meet in Olkalao in December. Probably from there, I'm going to move to Hedgarat for like uh, three weeks training so that I can prepare well to catch up with the weather there. So I look forward to do well, to get a slow to World Coast country. My main target is to focus on World Coast first because I don't have a title. And from there, I'm looking forward to train my title, 5,000 World Championships in Doha. Fireworks are expected in the men's race with defending champion Hilary Kering facing off with World Marathon champion Geoffrey Kirui along with last year's runner-up Franklin Gelel. Meanwhile, Benjamin Kigan, the surprise winner of the 3,000 meters triple chase at the IAAF Diamond League last year, will be taking part in the relays as part of his preparations to the World Championship in Doha, Qatar. Yeah, I am focusing that uh, to present uh, Kenya in World Championship and also in Africa uh, World Champion African uh, World Championship. The event will be used to select the KDF team for the National Cross Country Championships come trials. It's a team which we, we have prepared them in a way that the nature of the ability they have today, the art of they have done, the nature of the training they have done, the consistency and persistence in them is surely for the success for the World Cross Country Championships, which will be held in Eldred Sports Club in February.
The 43rd edition of the World Cross Country Championships are set to be held on March 30th in Aarhus, Denmark. Brian Otwal, NTV Sport. Yeah.